viewers, I would like to start with an analogy. Uh, namely, um, my question to you would be, how do you find a recipe for lasagna? So it's like an Italian dish where you have your lasagna plates, which is pasta, which can be seen here. Where's my laser pointer? Here, uh, you put them in layers, and between the layers you have either uh, meat, minced meat with a tomato sauce or vegetables, and you top it additionally with bechamel sauce and some cheese, obviously. And by the end of the day, you have a very beautiful Italian dish. And my question to you in this regard is, how would you look for a recipe for lasagna if you would look in cooking books? So obviously, we would, you would have an almost limitless library of cooking books. And my question is here, would you go from one book to another, starting with Brazilian cuisine, then going to Japanese cuisine, going to French cuisine, or would you actually go exactly for something which is which most likely contains a recipe for what you want to have and obviously you would not waste your time and go straight forward and pick either an italian cookbook or you would pick a cookbook for pasta so because you would expect that you would find something that you want exactly there and what i want to use this analogy for is actually um this is how you should approach dark discovery as well. You shouldn't just waste your time browsing through random things, hoping to find something, but you should use all the information you have and look exactly at the right spots to find good drug candidates. So what I'm going to talk about in this workshop is actually this cooking approach. So how can you use cooking books or chemical spaces to find exactly what you want, namely good drug candidates. Um, to explore the chemical space, we have two general possibilities. The first one is structure-based. So you know how your binding site looks like, you know all the residues inside of that, and you use all of this information to feed into your method, like docking or whatever it may be, to screen for potential drug candidates. If you do not have a target structure, you would go with likely ligand-based approaches. So you don't work with the structure of the protein, not the structure of the DNA, RNA, but you would just look at your ligand that is active and use this ligand as your guiding, guiding light <laughs> for other potential candidates. So sometimes you also have candidates from an uh, Essay, right? So you try to screen for uh, new antibiotics or for new anti cancer drugs. And sometimes compounds do have this activity. They do inhibit cancer growth or just kill those cells, but you don't know the target. So again, this is a case where ligand based drug discovery may be very interesting to you. With this, I would like to uh, go into CESAR for the structure based methods. Obviously, as I mentioned, random searching just wastes time and resources. Therefore, I just have to remove this one a little bit. Therefore, um, you can perform guided searching to enhance the quality of the results. Additionally, as a benefit, everything you do by feeding additional information into your workflow, this also accelerates the whole process. Now, I would go it to Caesar and Pick the PDB ID 7XW6. I'm just going to even copy it to make it even more easier for me. So, this is the user interface of Infinity. I hope you are still able to see it. And I've loaded my structure already, which is good for me. <laughs> and now I can see that I have a drug candidate here. So, this is like the co complex ligand and also the ligand of interest, which can be seen in this icon. Um, as I don't want to make this one as, as a basic introduction to Caesar, I will skip the most basics here and quickly go to the interesting part. By confirming my ligand, I also confirm the binding site, which adds all water molecules and all residues to it. I click on my ligand and zoom in a little bit. So here he is. 
I'll remove everything to make it a little bit more visible for you so you can easily keep track. So I will also turn on the binding side for you. So we get an in-depth perception. And there we go. So basically what we see here is our ligand. And the question is, how can you improve a ligand or what methods are out there, or at least hidden in our software, that you can use to perform chemical space exploration with? So in theory, you can always apply pharmacophore constraints. For this, I will now push my ligand into the docking mode. Pharmacophore constraints are more or less standard in every software, I would say. What they do, um, you place uh, constraints, obviously. So you want to keep certain interactions or certain features of a molecule in a spot. And if you would perform docking studies in a binding site, all of those ligands have to fulfill either all of them or only a few of them. So let's do it as a live example. Let's assume I would like to have, I have to play around with this little thing here a little bit. I would like to define a constraint here. So I would just place a constraint there, define the size, and also define what I want to have there. So maybe something aromatic to satisfy the binding site there. Apply, this would be the first constraint I place there. And the next part, I would maybe place one here. I just have to one here. And I want to have a particular atom there, maybe an oxygen. So as you can see, I have now applied two pharmacophore constraints. If I would now perform um, docking studies or docking, um, all of the poses that would be generated within CESAR, and the same goes for other softwares, they will all have something aromatic in this position and an oxygen in this position. With this, you can maintain or keep important interactions of every kind. You can do this for hydrogen bond interactions, charged interactions, uh, pi pi interactions, and so on. Um, this is something, though, that does not accelerate the drug discovery per se because the docking has still to be done, and it's also a little bit slower because more positions are considered to satisfy uh, the pharmacophore constraints. Um, but you get very good results that really match your query compound. Another thing you can do is template-based docking. So basically, um, you have a compound structure like this one, and the subsequent structures would be placed on top of that. So basically, it would search for an agreement or an alignment of um, molecular similarities. Maybe in this case, it would try to match a bicycle on this part of the uh, molecule. And by doing so, you provide the docking procedure with initial positioning, which can accelerate the drug discovery strategy. So I know from a pharmaceutical company that uses template-based docking as an acceleration for their virtual screening approaches. But this is not the best part. What I want to show you, what I really want to show you is actually fast grow because this is a very efficient method to perform chemical space exploration. FASCO is part of our inspirator mode. So I will push now my ligand to the inspirator mode. And what FASCO does, FASCO grows your molecule. So not so surprising there. Um, and how does it do it? FASCO searches in a pre uh, created library of fragments to match the shape of the binding site. So this is a shape-oriented method to satisfy unoccupied parts of the binding site. Here, in this case, I would use it to replace or remove this part of the molecule to see what other suggestions are out there. Right now, I have the 120,000 fragment library inside CESAR, 120,000, so a big, big library. And just to see how fast it performs, I will now click on the button. And now I will be screening 120,000 of fragments for the best substitution and decoration in this part of the molecule. It now fires up the library. So it takes a few seconds. Mm -hmm. 
So 120,000, what's that calculating? And what we get there are our results. Our results. <laughs> Uh, the last percent are very slow. Oh, here we go. So, still satisfying. And what you see, we get a lot of suggestions. What I will do now to show you how well it performs, I will also calculate the affinity for those predictions. So, CESAR uses a height scoring algorithm, which is free energy estimation. So, we get now a range of what activities we expect for those created compounds. This will take a few seconds. Can use it to check if there are any questions so far. Okay, this is something I have to follow up on. So, what we get here are our affinity estimations. And you will see directly, so this was our initial compound. It was expected to be close to the nanomolar range. And all the results created by FastGrow have better predicted binding affinities. And you see also the solutions are quite creative. Some are better, some are worse, but still very satisfying results. So and this is also something very interesting. What you get from this is that shape only can also be pretty useful to satisfy a binding site. So back to my slides. I have to rearrange a bit. So to sum up, how, oops, to sum up, to sum up um, what you can use in structure-based methods, you can use pharmacophore constraints. Uh, the important interactions are kept there. What's also interesting, you can also use your own SMARTS definitions to place particular um, groups and varieties of a molecule in a binding site. Um, the scaffold hopping potential of pharmacophore constraints, from my experience, is not as big uh, because if you want to maintain certain key interactions, um, there is not so much freedom to uh, other scaffolds or pharmacophores in this position. So you sometimes get a few hits the, here and there, but um, that's actually not uh, the usual application case. Um, the speed is okay-ish, so it's more or less the same as docking, maybe a little bit sl slower. But what you should always keep in mind is that you should at least perform some assessment of different combinations of pharmacophores. So in many cases, you should check if you really need those five constraints or if four constraints are more than enough, which also increase the less constraints you apply, the higher the potential of scaffold hopping is by the end of the day. And you should always check if by leave one out method, if one constraint is actually affecting your docking or your prediction uh, a little bit too much. Uh, next thing from a template docking, um, the best part about CESAR is that we allow some fuzziness to it, so it's possible to match, like in this case, um, something that is non-aromatic as this cyclohexyl ring here on a phenyl ring, but it's also able to match five member rings to six member rings. So this part of fuzziness in the um, alignment of the molecules during the template docking can also lead to some scaffold hopping here and there. Uh, the best part about template docking, though, is actually that it increases the speed of the method. If you would point me down to a number, 
it's like by a fa factor of four to maybe even higher, depending obviously on the structures you use and on your target. Um, the best part about Fasco though is that it's very versatile. Um, you can also create your own libraries, which I will show you in the next slide, and that you also use can use from pharma other pharmacophore constraints or pharmacophore constraints itself to guide your growing into a particular direction. Um, the scaffold hopping potential is not as big depending on where your pharmacophore actually binds, um, but as you saw, the speed is just uh, it's, it's it's amazing. Like I have never seen something performing so well. Um, so the question is, is it published yet? Yeah, it is published. It's not like we're making things up. <laughs> um, this publication is now accepted, was accepted in July 2022, so still very young. Um, and they are investigated how fast, if FASCO is able to reproduce um, binding poses of crystal structures, and yes, it was, and even outperformed uh, Viana Doc there. So very powerful tool. Really recommend this uh, publication there. Um, so as I mentioned, it relies on a wave volume matrix. So you can imagine that um, it's not docking and it's even not a mathematical approach per se. What it does, it performs bit, uh, bit hopping and um, tries to match the shape of both the conformer fragment and the binding site. And the results are very satisfying, surprisingly. Not surprisingly, but <laughs> they are very satisfying in this regard. Um, what we have, if you would download Caesar, uh, there is a small library with 12,000 fragments already inside, and you can download a larger set containing 120,000 fragments completely for free from our website as well and use it for your uh, projects. If you do not like our libraries, you're completely <laughs> allowed to use your own structures. Um, the input for the degeneration of the database is very easy. You just need smiles that contain the attachment point as an R, um, which now if you would translate those smiles into this one, this would be this structure. And you can adjust the number of conformer sampling. So the default is 10 as far as I can recall. And you can extend it to whatever you want to. So obviously the library size will increase as well. But this is not something that should be of uh, a problem in the long perspective. So um, why do you need several conformers? So especially if you have very flexible side chains, uh, very flexible fragments, like very long linkers with many rotatable bonds, it can make sense to create a library with, for those containing more conformers. So the sampling size of your uh, chemical space is a little bit bigger. Um, Further, uh, what you can do as well, you can use your own libraries and guide them to guarantee that everything that will be the output of FASCO can also be synthesized. So let's assume you would have this um, carboxylic acid as a free group inside your uh, ligand. You could generate databases that can be synthesized with this carboxylic acid in mind. So something that can be translated into this, so just defunctionalization of the functional group into an amide or an ester or a triazol or a isoxazol. Um, no, this is an oxazol. Oxazol. And in theory, you just need to code this part with an R in this position, and then you could use this for your growing database. Uh, this is something where you can use your own chemistry to guarantee that you can synthesize it and that it's also synthesizable per se. Uh, and the building blocks, this is something you can just download from any compound supplier, and I mean, I mean, e molecules, whatever, and use those building blocks as your fragment uh, points. Uh, the next thing I would like to talk about is actually the chemical space exploration ability of FASCO. So let's assume you would have a small fragment binder, like on the left here. I would like to grow this into something bigger. So let's assume we would work with the 120,000 library and use this one as an attachment point. In the first growing, we would attach this part of the molecule 
let's assume this one is the best candidate. And from a second growing, we can again go from this side here to this compound. And because we screen every time 120,000 possibilities, in theory, it's possible to screen 1.44 times 10 to the power of 10, so 14 billion compounds in two growing steps that can be done within minutes on your, or at least hours on your computer. Why do I say hours? Because obviously you need to assess the structures. Um, you need to rank them at least, but this is something that can be still done. And um, this is also so where your expertise kicks in. So you can just cherry pick the most promising compounds for follow up regarding lipophilic ligand efficacy, molecular weight, and so on. Um, as we do only focus on the best candidates and only what is likely to be effective or to be active, um, we don't waste computational efforts on unfavorable candidates. So in theory, the question is, yeah, but I can also, I could just generate uh, billions of compounds um, and then dock them into the binding site. Yeah, obviously you can do that, uh, but um, you need to know how to actually couple them to here and you need to enumerate those compounds. So just assuming you would enumerate billions of compounds without even touching a binding site, so without even pushing the docking button, the binding, the compound library would be several gigabyte big. And after generating 3D coordinates in the docking and the binding site, it would just blow up. So it would calculate months just to get some ideas, but you can do the same with FASCO within a very limited amount of time. And this is also something that Epi did with uh, FASCO. So Epi was our partner in developing FASCO. And what they did, they compared the performance of FASCO to standard docking methods. And as you can see here, they did weeks of calculation on the Amazon cloud or the Amazon web service and compared, to, compared it afterwards to FASCO. And the same procedure with FASCO was reduced to only a few hours for them. So weeks to hours. And I think the people who have worked with Amazon Web Services know how expensive it can be if you do it right. So you can just also see how much time and money you would save by using FASCO in this regard. So now we are leaving the structure-based methods for a while and dive into the chemical spaces. Um, as some of you or many of you are aware, we at BioSafeIT are trying to push and develop tools for chemical space exploration. So basically, why, as you can recall, I asked you before how many compounds you would screen usually during a virtual screening or how many structures you consider for this. And this is in this range, max, right? So Immolecus Plus, uh, approved drugs. So this is only like millions of compounds. But if you look to the right, you can see that we are now also have the Anamine Wheel space here, our Ottawa Chemwire space, uh, Wushi Galaxy uh, here. And as you can see on the right side, the uh, proprietary, proprietary spaces from uh, Evotech, Merck, GSK, uh, Jen, Johnson & Johnson, um, those spaces are way bigger. They're million times more, a million times larger compared to uh, enumerated spaces. And those combinatorical spaces are our domain. And this is also not something you can search with enumeration any longer. To give you an idea, I will use the GSK space uh, in the next slide. Um, but before I would do that, just to clear things up when I talk about compound libraries and when I talk, talk about chemical spaces, so we know what the difference is. And the main difference is obviously the type. Compound libraries are enumerated, means you have a compound ID, you have smiles codes, smile strings, additional info, whatever. So this is a list of molecules in an SDF file. A space on the other side is combinatorial. Um, so the compounds are not existing per se, but the compounds can be generated when you search in the space. And as you can see, the spaces are usually in the size of several billions, but can be way, way larger. Uh, compound libraries, I mean, you have most likely once in your life 
already downloaded one of the zinc uh, files containing millions of compounds. So millions is, I would say, very general. There are also smaller focused libraries available and very, very rarely uh, larger libraries pop up. But as you can see here, um, gigabytes in the for the millions and terabytes for larger uh, data sets compared to megabytes for combinatorical spaces. So obviously, since you have to work with those enumerated compounds, you need hours to weeks to screen those compounds and computationally assess them, while chemical spaces can be assessed in seconds to minutes. The question is always about the compounds. Um, are they accessible? I mean, if it's a commercial library, then it's more likely that uh, they are available. Um, the chemical spaces per se contain only accessible compounds because the definition for the or the rules for the creation of the compounds is chemistry. Right? So this is something that is ensured by the nature of the chemical space. To give you an idea why enumeration is cannot handle everything and it's not possible to just uh, collect larger libraries of molecules and enumerate everything. So let's assume you would enumerate the GSK space. So just create a list of every single compound inside the space. And this space would be 400 yottabytes large. So four times 10 to the power of 17. And you would need to just download it. Yeah, you haven't just, you. To just download the, uh, the, the, uh, the enumerated list, you would need 11 trillion years with modern high power broadband internet. Um, and this is, you haven't even touched it yet, right? So you haven't even downloaded, you haven't even opened up the uh, space, you haven't even uh, docked it, uh, which increases the size tremendously. Um, this is something that's not. Handleable. So, that's, so this is not accessible to us any longer if we would do it in a con, uh, conservative way with enumeration. So now I'd like to explain to you how we actually build those spaces. Um, we do it by having building blocks. And building blocks contain functional groups that can be combined. So in this case, we have in gray now an add side, uh, a side. Uh, red stands for this uh, alkynyl group, orange is our carboxylic acid, and then we have an amine in green here. And what we do, we use chemistry on this building blocks. And since every building block can be combined with another building block, if the chemistry is right, we get a lot of results. And this is not addition, this is multiplication. Right, so if you would have 10 of each, you would not end up with 30, but 10 times 10 times 10, you would end up with 1,000 compounds. And this is how we create those spaces. We have the building blocks. We create a set, many sets of uh, reaction rules, and we know which building block can be combined with another building block. And by putting this information of the building blocks and the chemistry, we use Colibri to create a chemical space containing billions of compounds. So in theory, very easy, very simplistic, no magic, no, no black magic behind it. This is like very, very easy chemistry. Um, the beauty of this approach is, um, we create the results when we search. So if we would start with a query compound, um, we would only pursue the most interesting or the most important results. So as you can see here, we only follow the blue arrows to our compounds. We combine this building block with this building block with this building block, then this one with this one and this one and so on. So we do not enumerate everything, we enumerate only those compounds that are of interest to us. So as you can see here, how many do we have here? One, two, three, four, five. We get five results because we think this is the best results you can get from the space or like based on your uh, query. And everything else was never created. So the rules are there to create those molecules, 
We just don't use them because honestly, we would just waste time on that. Therefore, not enumerated. Just to give you an idea of how fast it is, um, if you would use our platform Infinity to screen for uh, something in a 2.1 billion space, which was like Galaxy a few months ago, um, you would only need 21 seconds to screen those combinatorial space. If you would do the same on the whole 2.1 billion compounds, but enumerated, you would need 22.5 days. So way, way longer. Now you ask yourself, what's the circle about? And I don't know if the resolution allows it, but in the center of the circle, there's a tiny, tiny dot. <laughs> and the area of this dot and this uh, circle now uh, is proportional to the time required for the screening with infinity. So combinatorial is way, way faster. Exactly 92,500 92, times faster compared to an enumerated uh, method. So now I'd like to introduce you to Infinity, our chemical space navigation platform. Um, what Infinity does, it screens the vast chemical spaces. It shows you how the molecules are related. Our algorithm behind this one is called FTREES, which is our pharma fuzzy pharmacophore search, um, which is very great for scaffold hopping. And the best part about Infinity is that the compounds you find are accessible which means you can synthesize them yourself or buy those compounds. So the spaces we have at the moment are anamine from, uh, real space from anamine, uh, chemwire from Otava Chemicals, uh, Galaxy from Wuxi Lab Network, and Camp Space, uh, and the Freedom Space from Camp Space. Those three, the th three first of them, um, are make on demand chemical spaces. So everything you find in those can be easily purchased from the companies and the prices are very affordable. Um, I've discussed it with some people during a conference and uh, it's way, way more expensive to have PhD students synthesize something for you. Uh, and you know how uh, inexpensive a PhD student is. And for the same amount of money, you can get a lot of more compounds from the suppliers here. So just to keep it in mind for the future. And Camp Space is a little bit different. Um, Camp Space is a do-it-yourself space. So they sell, you can still search for all the compounds, um, but you have to synthesize them yourself. But every building block is accessible and they can be purchased from Camp Space. And they selected especially six very robust chemical reactions that even a first uh, undergrad uh, an undergraduate chemist could perform at the bench. So also very interesting if you want to be a little bit more uh, flexible regarding uh, accessibility of building blocks and compounds. So if you are required to do it yourself, you also have the tools nowadays. Um, yeah, so I basically introduced everything to you. Um, a little sneak peek for an upcoming space. Uh, I think in the next uh, few days, uh, maybe even tomorrow, we will be able to release our largest chemical space so far, um, 2.8 to the power of 10, 2.8 times 10 to the power of 12. So this is like 2.8 trillion compounds that will be accessible, but I don't want to spoil you too much there. And if you want to have even something larger, we also have our own chemical space, but this is more of an uh, idea generator for compounds to just see what may be inside there to get an idea for new scaffolds or something like that. So this is just random building blocks and the chemistry that we have to create the large chemical space, the knowledge space. Um, so people approach us and ask us, uh, well, uh, why do I actually need several chemical spaces? And the question is not trivial. Um, there was a paper published uh, at the beginning of 2022, and they compared the overlap of compounds inside the chemical spaces. So I would like to uh, put emphasis on the right side now, uh, the three commercial make-on-demand chemical spaces. 
And what you can see here, um, that the overlap between the real space galaxy and Camwire is only 76,000 compounds. So you have billions of compounds, 20 billions of compounds, and only 76,000 are in all three spaces. So the people also ask us, how is this even possible? So basically everybody has their own chemistry to synthesize the compounds. So they have different scaffolds that can result from their building blocks. Um, and also they have their own unique building blocks. So, and this combination results in this very, very small overlap. So I always recommend to people to actually search in all chemical spaces because they are more likely to find something that satisfies the needs there. Um, a little sneak peek that is not <laughs> top secret. Um, so we are implementing two new search methods for Infinity that I would like to introduce once again. Um, obviously, we can use F-trees for uh, the screening of fuzzy scaffolds or fuzzy related um, neighbors to the molecule. Spacelight is a fingerprint method that searches for something with very high tiny motor similarity, so close analogs of the compound. And one of my favorites is SpaceMax. SpaceMax is an exact substructure matching. So if you need exactly this part of the molecule, like on the left side, you can just select this one and every, every single compound that contains this one in the space can be also uh, retrieved with SpaceMax. Um, to give you a little idea about uh, F-trees, what F-trees does is it translates areas of the uh, molecule into chemical properties, into feature trees, as we call them. And that can be seen here. So on the left side, we have the citrocycles. And we know there is something that has some uh, hydrogen bond acceptor uh, qualities or aromacity to it. On the other hand, we have this uh, carboxylic acid, and that carboxylic acid is a very good hydrogen bond acceptor and contains through the uh, isomerization in the deprotonated state also some aromatic features. So what we do is actually we translate this whole molecule and use then the string of the, pharmac of the features to search in the chemical spaces for similar compounds. And this is something that can pop up during a search. So on the left side, on the top here, we have this compound and below we have an f trees result. And if you would compare them um, with your eye, naked eye and just the structures, you would never consider this to be very similar per se. But if you now compare it with coloring, you would say, ah, okay, I have a lipophilic tail on this side. I have some aromacity or lipophilic parts here and there. And this is how we align those molecules and search for analogs or related compounds in the space. Um, the beauty of f is that it's not relying on tiny motor similarity. So if you use, uh, if you would start a search for Reluzol, a uh, sodium channel inhibitor, you would get these results from a tiny motor search. From my perspective, very boring. So like, there is no magic behind it. There's no surprises here and there. The compounds are similar, but this is like Tenimoto, so I'm not, <laughs> this is what I expected. But this is not something I would like to see when I would like to perform a scaffold hopping approach or search for uh, fuzzy analogs of the compound. If I would use Infinity, though, I would retrieve something like Lamotrigin, which is also a sodium channel inhibitor. And the F3 similarity is there. So Infinity can see that this part, those parts of the molecule are actually similar and can also compare the second part of the molecule and see, tell me, hey, with the visual coding, I think this is a very good candidate because of the color coding. So please check for yourself. Yeah, do you see how similar those parts are actually considered by uh, Infinity? So, if you would like to see Infinity in action, I have uh, I have one little example prepared. Oh, I can have to switch this one off. Just so you see how fast it is. Um, load molecule. 
I just randomly selected one that popped up in my feed. So we now have this molecule. What we can use, uh, what we can do in Infinity, we can um, place pharmacophore constraints, or constraints, not pharmacophore constraints, we can place constraints. If we would go to one, uh, then I would tell, this is where how I tell Infinity, I would like to keep this structure also in the results. So you can also fine tune uh, whatever you would like to keep or where you want to have a little bit more of fuzziness. Like if I decrease this area to 0.8, um, it would be likely displaced by something else. And you can do it on every part of the molecule. Um, in the vendor cards, you can see which spaces are available. So you can also directly order your compounds there. And I will now show you the settings. So you can, the standard default setting is 100 compounds but you can go up to 100,000 compounds without any problems. And you can also use infinite F trees as a command line tool to optimize everything here and there. Um, by decreasing the target similarity, you also decrease, uh, you increase the uh, scaffold hopping potential in this regard. Um, the minimum similarity is how likely, how related the compounds should be to your query compound. And by increasing or decreasing the total diversity, you also increase the diversity of the compounds in the results. So if I would just drop it down to 0 0.9, all of my results will be chemically diverse between themselves. If I would increase it to one, my results will be very similar to each other. So um, maybe let's just do a search. I will now pick Galaxy with 8 billion compounds and start the search. Um, again, I'm screening 8 billion. Yeah, this, this is the number. <laughs> I'm screening 8 billion compounds with one click. You can even stop the time if you want to. And this is not like pre-recorded. So this is everything is on the fly because I like to keep it interactively and also to show you how fast everything is. Here we are. <laughs> um, and as you can see, I get a lot of results that, are, that can be ordered. They are all commercially available. You just write an email to uh, Bushi and tell him, hey, I would like to have this 15 compounds and then they will send you the compounds. Uh, if you would search in the real space, the real space is uh, very amazing regarding the speed. They synthesize the compounds within four to five to six weeks, and they are at your table within, I don't know, two months or so. So, and this is again, very affordable and very, very fast and reliable. So, and this is how would you would use um, Infinity for screening of the chemical space. Uh, next, I would just like to mention what's about to happen in the next few months in our offices. Um, the next addition will be the space light search. Um, I would don't want to go too much into detail because time is progressing. What space light does, it performs a finger-based screening for candidates. And um, by applying different fingerprint methods, you can also guide your search there. So now we have this dufacetinib compound and below we have different um, search results from the chemical space. If I would use the F CSFP fingerprint, I would get the closest neighbor. So this is something that Infinity would consider to be the most related compounds to my query molecule. You can see that all the important parts in this regard, in this part here are maintained. Um, it becomes a little bit fuzzy on the right side though because we don't have the um, electrophilic warhead any longer. Um, if I would like to keep the functionalities though, I could use another fingerprint, namely the ICSFP. And here we can see that the functionality here is maintained and also on the left side. So if this would be a hinge binding motor, we could also keep this one. And further, we also have a scap fault hopping method, uh, which is uh, covered by the TCSFP fingerprint. Um, and you can see here that we are now diverging a little bit. So this pharmacophore feature is now here. 
we have an hydrogen bond acceptor here and here and a hydrogen bond donor here and here. <clears throat> and what you can learn from that is that by applying different fingerprint methods, you also get completely different results, right? So this compound would just rank in the 4000s for ICSFP, whereas here the ICSFP, the functional groups, all of the compounds here are completely lost. So it can make sense to screen, to apply different methods depending on what uh, strategy you're, uh, uh, you're following. Another beautiful thing is SpaceMax. So what SpaceMax does, it uses a fragment or a substructure and searches the chemical space for everything containing this substructure. This is not limited to a terminal group. So if I would like to have maybe this part of the molecule, which is kind of like completely in the center, there is no problem. So all attachment points are also covered by this one. Uh, this is a very nice story. I hope some of you were able to participate in the drug space symposium back in the beginning of the year. No, it was in the beginning. It was in May. Um, Xavi uh, uh, <laughs> Barri um, presented his work with SpaceMax and what they did, they used actually a fragment-based approach and retrieved all structures containing their fragments from the chemical space and um, performed his stocking studies, performed his computational assessment on those compounds. And by the end, he purchased, or his group purchased 85 compounds and tested those. And uh, they found several very highly potent candidates from this one. So again, a very cheap approach for him, 85 compounds, chemically diverse, never, uh, nonetheless. And um, this is a very interesting approach, how to actually utilize um, chemical spaces for fragment-based drug discovery. So a very similar approach to the FASCO I presented to you a few slides before. Um, the question is always, okay, now I have the compounds, <laughs> what do I want to do with them? Um, you can do whatever you want to, right? So we usually per perform docking and virtual screening with those compounds. As you saw, it is easy to uh, use the interface, the graphical user interface on Infinity to retrieve 100,000 compounds without any issues. You can retrieve even more and then use those compounds for virtual screening. And um, I will tell you the next slide about this one. Uh, you can use it for ligand-based methods like principal component analysis, similarity scanner. Um, if you are a machine learning guy or AI guy, uh, go ahead, use those compounds for machine learning because those structures are at least accessible. You can buy them. Yeah, it's not like this uh, imaginary compounds. This is something people can buy, which is a very important factor for machine learning from my perspective. And you can also use this for cross-enrichment. So basically, let's assume you would have two different compounds available that are known binders of your target. You can just retrieve 100,000 compounds from Infinity for one compound for one active and do the same for the second active and then screen both lists with your actives to see if there is an overlap between those lists. Yeah. So if something overlaps for two different scaffolds, the chance is also very high that this compound will be active by the end of the day. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail about uh, ligand-based approaches. <clears throat> we have a very nice uh, workshop available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash tutorials. And this ligand-based drug discovery workshop uh, summarizes pretty well how you can actually use the similarity scanner to enrich um, uh, your results within CSAR, so something for a 3D-based method. So, as I mentioned, um, the power of the chemical spaces is that you start from something that you are more likely, uh, you start, you look at something that is more likely to contain what you want to have. So you don't browse everything randomly, but you look at very particular parts of the chemical space by using your query compound to search for similar compounds that match your query compound. So again, also with FASCO, please keep that in mind that random searching is just a waste of time and use everything you have to feed your um, methods with information to enhance the results and therefore also increase the likelihood to find something active there. Um, in the last part of the presentation, I would like to talk a little bit about chemical space docking. 
Chemical Space Docking is a service we offer at Biosurf IT. And what it does, it's the chemical space approach to docking. <laughs> Not so surprising. Um, the beauty of this approach is that we can easily investigate billions of compounds. So as you saw before, <clears throat> um, many people do not work with uh, do not work with over uh, one uh, ten million compounds. We have no issues with working something that is one hundred times or two thousand times larger. Um, there is a little twist to it how we do it um, because we do not dock the whole set of compounds. So we do not dock the whole chemical space. We do not enumerate every single compound but we build the results on the fly. So what we do in the first part, we dock only the small fragments, the building blocks, and check which of those fragments uh, are the best ones. So we take into consider consideration where can we grow from. This is how, what we call a linker. And we see the Lego building blocks here. Um, those are our linkers. We check for interactions like, oh, this forms a good interaction. We really do like it. This doesn't form interaction. We do not like it. We also check if there is space to grow. We sc obviously score those compounds to check if they uh, have also a good binding affinity to the target. We compare to known binders and so on. So once we have a set of good candidates, uh, the best candidates to grow for, we apply our chemical rules. So we know what building blocks can be combined with other building blocks. So we just use a small fraction and we only work with an even smaller fraction of the building blocks because all of the other results, yeah, so all of these candidates, they wouldn't end up as compounds either way, right? So if this is a bad candidate, the scoring for all compounds containing this one would most likely be worse compared to good fragments, right? So there is absolutely no need to investigate those compounds here. Um, so we only work with the best candidates and then we let them grow. And sometimes we also get good candidates here and there. So we again perform assessment um, of the best candidates. We score them with height and check the best ones. And then subsequently, we just order everything we want because the rules are there, the chemical spaces are designed that everything can be synthesized and the best compounds have an ID and we order those compounds and we get those compounds. So if you ask us how successful are you, I have two <laughs> success stories to tell. So this was published last week, uh, a very nice collaboration with uh, Crystals First, Anamine and Chemspace. And what we did, we used um, frag a fragment-based approach and performed chemical space docking to discover larger compounds. So we just start with very, with a few fragments, four of them, and then please pay attention that this scale is logarithmic. So it's not shaped like a funnel, as in the virtual screening, where you just filter in every step to, um, to being able to handle those numbers. No, we start with a very small number, and then we go into very, very large numbers, and end up with, again, smaller numbers. So it's like a pear-shaped thing going on. Um, what we did, we used those fragments, we performed the chemical space docking, and then we uh, bought those compounds. They were synthesized by Enamine, and we obviously assessed their potential. And as you can see, the best candidates uh, had a follow-up with the 13,500-fold affinity gain, um, which is very good for one single iteration, but the biggest part about this one, this whole process from we have the fragments, we get the fragments, we do the docking, we do the synthesis, and we do the uh, in vitro assessment, and also get crystal structures. This whole procedure took us nine weeks. Yeah, this is super, super fast. So this is uh, from another publication that's coming up. Uh, it was already accepted. It will be up in the next few days, weeks, let's hope, uh, in Nature Communications. And what you can see here, um, a comparison of brute force docking. So this was a collaboration with Genentech. 
and uh, we did chemical space docking for them. Um, what you can see here in blue are the results from the chemical space docking. And this is like the number of compounds in blue. Uh, in another scale, this is one scale, this is the second scale. And the first scale is also the number of compounds, but for full enumeration docking. So what we did, we took 1 million random compounds of the enumerated set. So just 1 million random molecules and doctor. And we did the same. We took 1 million random chemical space docking compounds and doctor. So, right, so once just random molecules and once with molecules from the chemical space docking. And what you can see here is that the compounds from the chemical space docking have way, way, way better docking scores. So they accumulate in the range where it starts to become interesting, right? So obviously, even those are not so attractive, but the quality is still pretty neat. And the important part is actually here where you get very good candidates for follow-up. What this graph also tells you, if you perform just random docking, you waste time. In 98%, so almost 99% of all the cases, you just get bad results because those are random molecules and those molecules are unlikely to bind at your target, right? So in 99% of the cases, if you would do just random docking, you get very bad results. Right? This is, I think this is a very powerful graph. But it's not just limited to chemical space docking per se, it is also something that can be considered for fast growth, for pharmacophore constraints, right? You don't want to do this. You just waste a lot of time and you're just investigating the wrong molecules. You want to do something like this, but for this, you just need to feed in information and be a little bit smarter than just doing something randomly. The best part about chemical space docking, though, it's that it's scalable. So if you would increase the size of your library, the computational efforts skyrocket, yeah, you just need more molecules or you have to um, uh, re you have to reduce the numbers of poses generated or do rough docking and then just take the best candidates for redocking and refinement. Yeah, this is like you need to be smart. This is not something you want to do. Chemical space docking, though, it's just investigating a small fraction, but every single compound can end up in the screening. So this is also something important. It's not like we are missing out on something. Um, every compound can be created within the space. Every compound is a legit candidate to be created, but it's just not created if it's not required. Right? So we can scale with the chemical space docking to trillions, to how many compounds you desire. It's not, not a problem. So just to compare, if I haven't convinced you yet, then the hits for this table will do. Um, for the PKA project, this is the one with um, uh, the, 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 the um, crystals first and anamine and chem space. Uh, we had a 27% hit rate. The best candidate was uh, at an um, inhibition of 700, 740 nanomole. Nanomolar, and this is the genetic publication. You can see here they get very diverse hits with a hit rate of 30%. So the hits rates are the hit rates are really, really good for those two projects. And also for others. <laughs> Let me tell you that. Um, so basically, uh, you can save a lot of time and resources by doing chemical space talking with us. Uh, everything is synthetically accessible. I mean, it's not like we have to, we can, we do it in our way, but this is something you can do as well, right? So you're not only limited to us. If you have a nice idea how to approach this one, you can go ahead and do it as well, right? Um, the follow up with the compounds is very fast. So within four weeks, you get initial results, which is pretty good. Uh, you get a lot of diverse chemotypes, which is really important for especially the early stages of drug discovery. Amazing hit rates, and what is also the best part. Um, you can also combine it with X-ray, right? So we got several structures that will, will be published now on the RCSLB that are also accessible. Um, everything can be seen. You will get a lot of results, and it's just the first iteration, right? And if you have crystal structures from the first iteration, 
you have a very good spot to evolve your compounds even further. Well, I will reach, reach the end. So <laughs> now to my closing remarks. Um, uh, the chemical space is the great potential if you investigate those. Uh, please, please, please do just not do brute force stalking. It's just a waste of time. Be a little bit smarter and supply your virtual screening or everything you do on your computers with additional information to get results. Um, with this, I would like to ask you if you would be interested in a license. Um, so if you would like to have a license for Caesar or Infinity, please tell me. You can also select several of those. Uh, this is also especially directed to people who already got an evaluation license already uh, and would like to have it maybe a second time for our own purposes or to just retest them. Uh, <clears throat> so I think the people who are still awake have voted. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, just to let, let you know, yeah, people are interested uh, in both platforms, so thank you. Um, if you would like to uh, get in contact with us regarding chemical space docking, um, go ahead, please write us an email, contact the um, we can discuss your targets, no strings attached, it will be very confidential. Um, maybe we can help you, maybe not, but uh, you need to talk to us to know that. Um, with this, I would like to announce our next webinar, which will be next Thursday. We welcome Dr. Debano Das from Expos Therapeutics, a very close friend of uh, Biosoft IT, and he will present very interesting insights to fragment-based drug discovery. So, um, you're more than welcome to join us there. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if